Welcome back, guys, to another episode of We Love Pets here on Pet World Insider. We've got an amazing guest, Deborah Hamilton from Hamilton Law and Mediation. She was just in studio with us doing a PetX talk, and you guys will be seeing that shortly. Or it's already been aired when you see this. I don't know when our schedule's going. But it's great to have you in here, Deborah. Thank you so much, Derek. <laughs> I appreciate you coming down, doing the PetX talk with us, and now sitting around the table. If you guys want to join the conversation with us, you guys use the hashtag We Love Pets. Send it to us at Pet World Insider on all the social media platforms. Or reach out to me, Pet World, at Producer Derek, also on all the social media platforms. But, Deborah, on this show, we love pets. So the whole uh, thing, what we do here is we just talk pets. And what we like to start off with is kind of what your pet history was. Well, I've had pets since I was about five years old. I had a little German schnauzer when I was young. And then I got my first Irish setter when I was in eighth grade. It actually was given to my sister in college. And it came home. And from that moment forward, I was in love. A neighbor up the street had had two or three Irish setters that we always walked for him. That was a great thing. And we got our own Irish setter, Treb. And from that moment forward, I always had Irish setters. I have, I'm way over the half century mark and have had Irish setters for 50 of those 55 years. So it's been pretty good year, pretty good times. I love them. That's awesome. I mean, that's, that's, I, you know, it's funny because my sister, that's how I got my first dog. I mean, we had family dogs, but the first dog, it was one of my sister's friends, you know, they said, okay, we can't take care of the dog. And I remember jumping on a bike and riding over to the kid's house to get the, and dog. the parents. Yeah. And riding back and, oh yeah, no, that brings back memories. Well, it was interesting because my mother was afraid of dogs. She had the German schnauzer big enough. That was good. But then Treb came home and Irish setters are substantial dogs and she was afraid of Treb. But by the time my sister and I were ready to take Treb with us after college and things like that, my mother said, excuse me, she's staying here because she'd <laughs> fallen in love with her. So we all got different you know, Irish setters going forward. But yeah, it's, it's all about the memories of how you got where you are today. So let me ask you about how you got to where you are today with Hamilton Law and Mediation. How does a pet play into that whole thing with you? I litigate. So I was an assistant district attorney in my other life. I was an inspector general, assistant inspector general for the transportation in New York. I did all sorts of investigation, talking to people, trying to work out solutions, litigating sometimes, not often, in the DA's office litigating all the time. So I went from litigating all the time to litigating not so much, trying to work things out, to taking 13 years off and being a PTA mom. And believe me, all of my training as an attorney stood in my way getting parents to do what I needed them to do as a PTA head in New York. So I decided I would figure out a way to have these people work with me. Well, that was eight years, 13 years of my life of being a PTA mom. Went back to practice 13 years later and realized it had ruined me for litigation because I really wanted to enable people to find their own solutions, to work together, to get you know moving forward. So I was litigating a little, having great success, winning my cases, but I realized that everybody's relationship was destroyed. I was helping destroy people's relationships with the animal that they loved. I just was interviewed by Bloomberg, and the gentleman who interviewed me actually put my quote as the bold on the on the headline. Say headline, the headline. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> okay. having a brain yeah. moment, and it said the dog doesn't hate your ex. And what I do is I enable people to really focus on what's best for the pet. Courts don't do that. And I realized through my litigation career that courts don't focus on what's best for the pet because it's a chair, it's property. If you really want to have a conversation about what's best for the animal, the best thing to do is either stop, drop, and roll if you can. And if you can't, hire a mediator to help you stop, drop, and roll. Because that's what mediation does. It enables you to have that conversation that you, Rob, can't have with Derek because you're so emotional. It enables someone to sit in the room. I'm emotional, man. Yeah. Don't I know. mess with Very me. Very emotional. Don't mess with me. It enables somebody to sit in the room and help you feel heard, respected, and understood. Right. I dropped my, my litigation practice altogether, much to my husband's chagrin, and started mediating full-time. I won't litigate. If you call me and you want me to litigate, I'm a great litigator. No, sorry, not going to do it. Because I know that truly what's in the best interest of your animal, you can figure out better than someone who doesn't even know your animal. Sure. Well, and, and you talk about conflict. I mean, there's so many different types of conflicts. I want to know the one that, though, jumps out to you from Divorce. the pet world. Divorce. Okay. Because people really either use the pet as a wedge or use the pet as the one thing that they can't agree on. 
I've had so many attorney, divorce attorneys come up to me and say, boy, I wish I'd known you. I had a divorce agreement right there, ready to sign. And then I said, okay, so who gets the dog? And it blew up because they just, well, first of all, some attorneys say, well, Rob, you deserve 50% of the dog. And Derek, you deserve 50% of the dog. Now you work full time. You have no time to have the dog 50% of the, the, the dog isn't used to somebody being away all the time, but nobody has that conversation because yes, indeed, you deserve 50% of the dog under the law, but is that in the best interest of the dog? So in divorce, clearly most important is to have a mediated conversation, not go to court because the courts reluctantly even take these discussions and then come down on full ownership. And people say to me, well, that's okay. Derek got the dog and Derek should have gotten the dog. I said, yes, but if the dog gets sick and Robert is the person with the deeper pockets, how will that dog be cared for? Because now you've severed all ties where if you could share, you could share everything about the dog. And it just is a matter of, Robert doesn't like Derek and Derek doesn't like Robert. Great. But the dog does like you. So what the, the, the quote this guy pulled out and put in Bloomberg, I laugh because that is my mantra. Remember who the dog likes because the dog actually, if they're in a room and Robert is the main caregiver, they're going to run to Robert. But if nobody's in the room but Derek, they're going to run to Derek. So the dog does like you. Right. Wow. And, and you know, I, I'm having these visions of well, I okay. was going to take the first half, the front half of the dog. You're going to take the front half? Back half so you <clears throat> clean up duty. Yeah, yeah, I, I clean up duty. Yeah, I do get the wagging tail, though. <laughs> That's so. true. Uh, I have to feed it. Yeah, I mean, it, well, okay, Deborah, we've, we've, we've reached it. agreement. <laughs> that works. That's uh, how well dog, it works, folks. That might not be in the best interest of the dog, but it works for both of you. That works. <laughs> it was build one of those tunnels. You live on one side, I'll live on the other. You know, I, I, I we joke about it, but... Does the pets have any rights in, in this? I mean, how does that factor in? Not really. They don't take what's in the best interest of the pet into consideration mm. in court because, as I said, it's property. So that chair has about as much right to go with you or Derek as a dog. Interesting. Under the law. Yeah. Now, they do take things into consideration. People do bring it up. But judges aren't really interested in that. It's not like a child. Even though I know both of you and I are wonderful pet lovers, which one of your animals isn't a member of your family. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So it's not like you could separate it and it's something that really needs to be addressed and animal rights, animal welfare advocates are trying to address it in a way that changes legislation, but it takes so long and costs so much money. Mediation, not so much time, very less money. And so you're really taking care of yourself and your dog in the best way you can. Do we change like the outcome and like, probably get more problems if we actually change the dog from being property to like the legislation and actually changing like its classification of that animal does it make it harder for us in the future if yeah going from property to now so having say non-human uh, animal yeah. right non-human non-human animal yes you you will because there's no precedent there's nothing set there's what they're trying to do is enable people say in a case of a dog gets shot by a police officer or a dog is the subject of malpractice with a veterinarian what they do is they want to have emotional distress they want to have punitive damages they want to have loss of companionship that kind of thing compensated and that's coming down the pike and it should because quite frankly if say veterinarians is a good example, charge so much for veterinary care because they're banking on the fact that we will pay $1,000 to save the life of a dog that's worth nothing because we got it at a rescue. Yeah. You know, you could replace it. Uh, my father often says, much to my chagrin, that, you know, it's only a 50 cent but bullet. And I go, but dad, these are my dogs. And they're what veterinarians are arguing on one end of the spectrum is the dog isn't worth anything. So if I something happens, I apologize, but it's not worth anything, you don't get anything. However, they're banking on the fact that Robert and Derek and Deborah will spend thousands of dollars to save their life, so they charge. We have and we do. Yeah. We, yeah. So yeah. If, if you're going to spend thousands of dollars to, to save your dog, then you should be compensated for the value of that dog based on that, not based on the fact that it's property. Right. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, having some of the background I do, that then raises the cost because they're going to over-insure, they're going to over-practice you know, practice defensive medicine, it, it really is, it's such a slippery slope. And, it and is, that's but the defensive problem. medicine isn't so bad if, in fact, they then take care to really decide whether or not that should be done, that test should be done. That right. pro- it, well, it, but, it, it, and that's kind of my argument because we can't even get them to do tighter testing to get them to do other things 
I just, I don't know. I have my concerns w- with that. I see, I see both sides and I'm one of those and Derek knows this cause I've got into heated. Uh, I could have used you to mediate it. Um, discussions about, are we, you know, pet parents, are we pet guardians? Are we pet owners? You know what? And, you know, at different levels and different points, I may feel I'm this at for this particular and under the issue. law, it makes yeah. a difference. It does. Huge difference. Under the law, it makes a huge difference difference. sometimes in the benefit of the animal and sometimes not so much. Right. And there are large arguments that say that if insurance companies enabled veterinarians to have malpractice that would cover them for larger um, recoveries, they wouldn't raise their premiums so much that it would really impact us more than maybe 41 cents. Hmm. And that's something, since we all are paying thousands of dollars for our dog's care, 41 cents is less than a cup of coffee. Yeah. Right. Way huh? less than a cup of coffee. Yeah. That was $5 just more than start up, so. Yeah. I charge 10. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, you hit on uh, stop, drop, and roll. We, in the PedEx talk, that's what our, your topic is, but for a short little condensed so that people who are watching this kind of get an understanding. Go watch it. Yeah, go, go watch it. PedEx talk to know it, or if it's coming out, watch it when it comes out. But, uh, so if they are watching it now, kind of just give a little short little. Well, it's my process that I developed when I was trying to teach people how to use mediation, because quite frankly, if you can't do this, you need a mediator. If you can't stop talking when you're in conflict with someone about an animal, And listen to what they're saying totally full. Don't stop. Don't interrupt. Don't say, but Robert, but don't stop. Stop talking and listen because you're going to hear things that you can understand. And really, the other party is going to feel as if you're really listening to them and getting what they're saying instead of trying to interrupt them and answer them and tell them how they're wrong. So stop talking and listen. Drop the need to be right. This is the hardest piece because, of course, we're always right. I'm right. You're right. Everybody's right. We have that on tape. I'm right. It's right. That's absolutely right. But it's okay not to be right first. You can be right second. It doesn't make you wrong. Enabling them to be right and let them get their entire story out, which is the stop and listen part. Stop and listen. Don't need to be right and show them where they're wrong right away because you know what? They can't hear you. They're in the heat of the motion. You said this before. I'm just waiting to explode. Once they explode, there's no way that you're going to even hear what someone else is saying. So it would be better for them to just... Drop the need to be right at this moment because it isn't going to make any impact in you. And it's only going to fuel the fire to the roll off your back one. What they say, let it roll off your back. Because if you do, you will enable them to go home and think about, oh, my God, I can't believe I spoke to Robert that way. I really had an out-of-body experience. And they apologize. They come back and apologize. Someone said to me, oh, they'll never come back and apologize. I said, you would be surprised when they go home to their wife and say, do you know how I told Robert off this time? Their wife say, you said that? And then they go, oh, my God, I can't believe it. And what did Robert say to you? Well, he didn't say anything. He just said, I, I appreciate you telling me this. She goes, well, you better go back and apologize. <laughs> now, if Robert had said, are you kidding? You're so stupid. This is what I feel, blah, blah, blah. No room for Going back for an apology because you've thrown fuel on the flames. So for our stop, drop, and roll um, PEDX talk, we absolutely give the steps that you need to take and the reasons why you want to take a stop, drop, and roll approach. It's a great talk. I mean, if it's up, watch it. If it's coming out, watch it. So I read these go up all the time. So I also want to talk about the book as well because the book is a great read and a further exploration of what you're really Hoping we'll all learn. Well, when I learn, I learn in short bites. So that's why I do stop, drop, and roll. I also have AKA, which is also known as, back from my DA days, but is address the problem, keep the relationship, and appreciate. Appreciate how somebody else thinks. It's not how you think, and that's okay, but appreciate. So in the book, it goes through the six steps. It goes through address the problem, keep the relationship, and appreciate, and stop, drop, and roll. Because it gives you all the reasons and the scenarios where you can apply these, and you don't need to hire a mediator. But if you can't apply them, you should first go to a mediator, not an attorney. And I know that seems really self-serving. However, I can't be everywhere. But mediators will enable you to have that conversation before it gets to the escalated part where you're going to be hiring an attorney and spending thousands of dollars litigating on an animal that is a chair in court. Well, and it reminds me when you're, when you're talking about this, bringing in someone from the outside who is clear and fresh Neutral. from it. Yeah. yeah. Neutral. It, it, it's the same thing. People ask me, I, you know, oh my gosh, I can't get a good photo. I see all the photos you do. What? It, and I always say, I can get a great photo of somebody else's dogs. Right. But I can't get a great photo of my own because I, they've got certain signals that, you know, hey, 
daddy's going down on the floor. Let's get, you know, yeah. he wants to play. And it, it's kind of the same way where, Hey, you just got to have that break. If you want to get some resolution, you got to sometimes just bring somebody in fresh so that each person can go, okay, you know what? Here's my side. Here's my side. And I, I, I've gone through it in different business ventures and whatnot. And I will say well, one of the things about that process is, as you said, listening, you go, well, that's, that wasn't what I meant or that wasn't what I intended or that like so far off base, but it's not my reality, but it may be their reality. Absolutely. So, and, yeah. and you'll hear things that you thought were their reality that you were mistaken. You're like, you didn't mean that? No, uh, I didn't mean it that way. I said it this way and that's how I meant it. Wow, I just absorbed it differently. And for, for me, if you hire an attorney, they're going to champion your cause, which is fabulous yeah. and I love that. I do. However, nobody can champion your cause better than you can. And nobody can decide whether or not you're going to make or break a different resolution. A mediator is going to champion your side if they're a good mediator. There are not so good mediators out there. You don't want a mediator who's going to tell you what to do because that's really not mediation. To give a little nutshell of what mediation is, it's a neutral who comes in and lets you tell your story and lets your adversary tell their story. And then both of you get to hear each other for the first time probably in this whole disagreement. If the mediator doesn't allow you to hear the story firsthand or doesn't allow the other party to talk or hear your story, you really want to run in the other direction because where animals are concerned, um, mediations that are done in separate rooms, it's called caucus, don't work because we have to see the whites of your eyes. We have to see the emotion that is on everyone's face because you could say something and it could be translated. It's not heard the same way as when you see the person saying, but I didn't mean to run your dog over. I didn't see it. You know, you have to see that in That's order right. to see the remorse. Otherwise it just is somebody shuttling back and forth, exchanging ideas. Well, and the other thing too, is there are some people who are so adverse to any kind of conflict that they just can't communicate directly with the person they're in conflict to. Right. So no, and mediators are the great people who usually what happens in my mediations, which I love, is that you and Derek will start talking to me because you have to convince me to believe you. And in doing so, because we do one at a time, Derek hears everything and understands better how you feel and vice versa. It makes it so easy. My job so easy because afterwards you start talking to each other. A mediator's job is always done well if they stop talking to the mediator and start talking to each other. That's great. Appreciate it. I mean, everything you're saying makes total sense, and I hope it's making total sense to everyone out there. At this point of the show, what we like to do is uh, let the guests pick a question from our dog bowl. And if you guys want to submit questions to the dog bowl, use a hashtag. I can't wait. We love pets on uh, all the social media platforms. You can reach out on at Pet World Insider or myself at Producer Derek, and we'll get those questions in the bowl. Deborah, go ahead and pick a okay. question. Let's Let see go. what we got. Do you read it or do I? You read it. You read it. Favorite animal-related movie? Oh. Oh, we kind of answered that one. Yeah. Uh, so let's, okay. let's do a yeah. different one. We should have thrown that one out. My bad, guys. That's okay. We'll go with a different one. I'm good. What was your first pet? Ooh. We, we did that. I like that we one. Talk, well, we we about did kind of talk about that already. But, wow, we're running through the questions here. Yeah. <laughs> Want me to do another one? I'll, I'll answer the first pet well, one. Let's a little, little bit more about your first pet. Okay, so Treb came home from Colorado. My sister had received her as a Christmas gift from her roommate in California and flew the dog from California to Colorado where my sister was in school. And then my sister almost flunked out of school while she was caring for the pet at Colorado State University and flew the dog home at spring break. And the dog never left New York again. And she's in all my wedding pictures. And she just was the catalyst in my life. I, I think Treb was the most important feature in my life because it taught you responsibility. It taught you kindness. It taught you care. It was wonderful. She was, without a doubt, the greatest dog. And she unfortunately died when I was away at college. And I, I never got to say goodbye. But she lives on, in fact, so this is a, a tidbit of information. Um, she lives on, in fact, in a puppy that she had that I called Raisin. And my kennel name, I show Irish setters and long-haired dachshunds, and my kennel name is Rum Raisin because, and if I start to cry, I apologize, I wanted this first dog who was no more a show dog than the man in the moon, but I loved her to pieces. Every one of my dogs carries her, ring, her name on to a championship because they're Rum Raisin Irish setters. So Raisin is in every one of their names. 
That's awesome. Yeah, no, that's great. That is very good. Okay, Rob, your first pet, because I don't think we've talked about it. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I mean, you know, honestly, my parents had a dog when when I was born, and so Susie would have been um, the first one. She was a collie. But the one that I probably remember the most is the little uh, a dog we called White Spot. We were young, um, and she was this black mix, little small dog. Um, and unfortunately the folks who had her had, um, the kids had mistreated her and broke her back. And so, um, they didn't know what to do with her. Um, you know, talking back and forth, my mom said, you know, okay, you guys can get her. So we jumped on the bike, rode over to the house. I'll never forget my sister on the handlebars, me on the beach cruiser, you know, pedaling and then bringing her back. And, I think, uh, wow. Yeah, it is emotional. I think, uh, from the aspect of, as you said, it, 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 it really was the right time for me to also learn a lot of lessons about caring about the delicate nature, because we had to, to handle her, you know, this is gosh, 30, 40 years ago now. So we didn't have the veterinary techniques that are out there today that could have dealt with that. We just dealt with it with a little bit of advice from a veterinarian. So, um, but yeah, she really shaped and, and she was just a ball of love and, and then, you know, the next dog came and, and then the next dog and the next dog. And so, um, but I've had hamsters when I was there, um, fish galore. So, you know, when I was a kid, I mean, that was one thing I think my parents were really great about. I mean, I may not have had lizards, but they were in the backyard and we had them in the fort with us. And, you know, so animals really, as you said, when you look back, you go, I may not have and at the top of my mind that they've had this impact, but they do. They really get in. Yeah, it teaches you responsibility in a big yeah. way. Yeah, uh, my first pet, we weren't really a pet household, actually, from the get-go. We had rabbits, which I don't actually remember ever having rabbits at the yeah. house, but we did at some point have rabbits. We had a cocker spaniel for a week because it got stolen out of our backyard. Ooh. <laughs> we, we saw it down the street, but we couldn't prove that that was our dog because it was so fresh and new. So my actual like first pet... I think had to be a parakeet and we named it flipper very original but (laughs) but like that was our first pet our first like kind of introduction as like taking care of something having to clean the cage out feed it and uh i just remember the big thing was my dad really took to the uh, bird which he was really against it but then he was the one outside with it and we had a pool table in the backyard and he was always out there playing with it on the table and i was like but that i think is my first real like pet that we've had i know we've had a couple be like animals in the house but not long enough to really i guess consider them pets but yeah so wow. okay I think that's cool that's yeah <laughs> i know we might have gone over that with you but, but a little bit more out of it it's great. Yeah. at this point now uh we're kind of coming to the end here but we'd like to have you share one little tip that might change some pet world's uh insider's life out there and what you might want to leave kind of like a little nugget of knowledge my greatest nugget of knowledge is that the pet likes both of you. So if you're at odds with someone, remember the pet loves both of you. Or remember that if you're talking to your neighbor about their barking dog, get out of the area, go somewhere else and have that conversation because it's really hard to have that conversation right over the fence where the dog is barking usually. So just take the time to listen and remember that the pet loves everyone and you're their guardian. We just said that the responsibility, you're their guardian. So your tidbits to take with you is make sure that you recognize that the dog loves everyone and don't try to have that conversation somewhere where the conflict is constantly arising because it doesn't work well for you. And hire a mediator. But if you can't, if you do it yourself, fabulous. If you can't, don't let it spiral out of control. Hire a mediator. Deborah, thank you so much. Uh, We want to make sure people know where to find you online and check out all the stuff you're doing out there in the pet world. Uh, is there a website we can find? Absolutely. Online? It's uh, hamiltonlawandmediation.com. You can get my book, Nipped in the Bud, Not in the Butt, <laughs> How to Use Mediation to Resolve Conflicts Over Animals on Amazon. It's a bestseller on Amazon. And I'd love to have people join me because we do several webinar series because we talk about how to care for your pet long-term, short-term, how to resolve conflicts. Love to have people check out my website because it really is all pet-friendly like you guys are. It's all about our pets. So it's hamiltonlawandmediation.com. 
and it's not meditation, although we do sometimes meditate. It's mediation. <laughs> and thank you both for having me here. I love being here. Well, I, and I just got to throw this out because we talk with a lot of folks who have a lot of resources and a lot of time there are other resources out there that maybe have similar information. Your site is very unique and the resources that Deborah's brought to all of us is truly unique. So go check it out because it will make a big difference if that need arises. Absolutely, because better. most attorneys will tell you, don't mediate, I can represent you, and you can spend $5,000. If you call the mediator, both of you split the cost. So why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you have somebody in the room to help you resolve the conflict? It's not in the attorney's best interest for you to mediate. I just need to put that out there. I love you, my fellow attorneys. I love you very much, but it's not in your best interest for your client to mediate first. But then if it doesn't work out, you can always hire an attorney. That's what I love about it over arbitration, because arbitration... You can't right. re appeal from that decision. Mediation, if you don't work it out, go hire an attorney. Great. So you're doing the best of both worlds. Awesome. Well, thanks Deborah, so much. Thank you again for being on the show. If you guys want to join the conversation, you guys know, use the hashtag we love pets and send it out to at Pet World Insider to get Rob or my attention or send it out to myself, at Producer Derek. And, I mean, join us and be part of the conversation. Let us know what guests you guys want to see on our future shows. And um, thanks again for joining us. See you guys next time.